Matthew chapter 14. We are going to begin in verse 1 this morning as we study God's Word. It says in Matthew 14, verse 1, At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the report about Jesus, and he said to his servants, This is John the Baptist, who is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. And for Herod had laid hold of John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had said to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And although he wanted to put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. And in verse six, it says, but when Herod's birthday was celebrated, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. In verse 7, it says, therefore, he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. So she, having been prompted by her mother, said, give me John the Baptist's head on a platter. If you've never read this scripture before, I just want to let you know that is exactly what she asked for. <laughs> Notice in verse 9, it says, and the king was sorry. Not sorry for repentance, but he regretted it. It says, nevertheless, because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he commanded it to be given to her. In verse 10, it says, so he sent and had John the Baptist, or John beheaded in prison. And his head was brought on the platter and given to the girl. And she brought it to her mother. And then his disciples came and took away the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you, Lord, this morning. Lord, for your word. And Lord, this morning we ask, Lord, that you would bring conviction, Lord, where we need to be convicted. Stir up repentance. Not sorrow, Lord, for our sin, but genuine repentance, God. Lord, remind us as we look at this passage, Lord, of the power that you have, God. We love you, Jesus. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Some of the best, every once in a while, I'll read an article where I just find it extremely interesting. You know, some of the most ridiculous rumors that were heard. Remember when we lived in central Florida, we lived just outside of Tampa Bay, and about an hour and a half from us was uh, Magic Kingdom or Disney World. And one of the rumors that was going around at that time when we lived there was that Walt Disney's body had been frozen and buried beneath uh, Cinderella's castle, oddly enough. Uh, just some of the rumors, you know, just you hear that are just absolutely uh, just fast, sometimes fascinating, sometimes absurd. I remember one that I really enjoyed for a long time until I found out it was untrue was uh, Mr. Rogers. If you've ever watched, I grew up watching Mr. Rogers, and Fred Rogers had a preschool television show in which he had this toy train and, you know, just and he taught kids simple things on his television show. And for a long time, there was a rumor that he was a part of the Navy SEALs and that he had 150 kills. I thought, yeah, that man's gangster. You know, it's just, you know, you, and he had full sleeve tattoos and he always wore cardigan sweaters and he talked in such a sweet tone and so forth. I thought, man, that guy's just, he's hiding now. He's like James Bond, you know, kids show. Oh, apparently the Navy SEALs came out and had to make a statement saying it was untrue. One of another one I really enjoyed was uh, for a long time after the death of Elvis Presley. There was a guy who suspiciously looked like Elvis and he was spotted at a Memphis airport buying a one-way ticket to Argentina, uh, giving way to the rumor that Elvis was still alive and well in Argentina. And you can actually go watch YouTube <laughs> videos on that. And I did this week. Uh, there's photographs that people say, well, this is Elvis, look at this lady. Anyways, these are some of the best rumors that I found that I enjoy. Evidently, there was a rumor going around at this time of Jesus' day that Jesus was John the Baptist that had risen from the dead. You remember, if you remember in John chapter 16, we will get there in a couple of chapters, that 
when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, he says, who do men say that I am? And his disciples said, some say that you're Elijah, some say that you're Jeremiah, some say you're some of the other prophets. But you remember the first thing they said, some say that you are John the Baptist. There was this rumor going around that Jesus was John the Baptist. And it would be concerning for Herod because Herod was a Sadducee. And Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in an afterlife. And so here's Herod. He was someone who identified with a certain group that did not believe in life after death. And here is, he comes to find a man that he has killed, as we'll study in a moment. And he says, well, he must be John the Baptist, risen from the dead. I find that interesting. I like what one man said. He said, even the unbeliever staggers when the conscious is awakened. And here we find in verse 3, Herod, it says, laid hold. Matthew gives us a little bit of a flashback, understanding of what is taking place. He says in verse 3, for Herod had laid hold of John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Now, when you read through the Bible, you find that Herod is mentioned several times, but there are actually several Herods, and most of them are all related to one another, and they're pretty much all scoundrels. And it is kind of very, it's honestly very confusing trying to keep them all straight. But the, the father, Herod the Great, was the, was the king at the time, you remember, when Jesus was born. History tells us that he was actually a great in the sense of building buildings and so forth, but he was a very, he was actually, history tells us, he was a little paranoid man, not li a little paranoid, he was actually little in the sense that he was small and he was extremely paranoid. He thought, er you know, he would kill everybody. He, um, he just was a cruel man. And he was the father, and when he died, he split up his kingdom, and he gave a fourth of his uh, kingdom to a, his son, Herod Antipas, who we read of here, who would rule over the area of Galilee. Now, there was an occasion when Herod Antipas went to visit his brother, Herod Philip, who is married to their niece, Herodias. I, which is odd enough, I understand that. <laughs> Uh, Herod Philip was away on business, so Herod Antipas, who was visiting, had an affair with his brother's wife, who also was their niece, and then he convinced her to leave her husband and then to come back with them. And evidently, this was a public scandal that was well known among the people. And here's what John has to say about it in verse 4. He says, it is not lawful for you to have her. Remember, John the Baptist was a preacher who had a, had a two-part message. He just, it was very simple. He preached repentance, and he says that the kingdom of God was coming. He just said, hey, you need to repent. He told everybody when they came to see him, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And it didn't exclude the rulers of this day. And he tells us here, and Matthew continues on in verse 6, and gives us more of the context of the adulterous relationship, the sickness that is taking place. He said in verse 6 that when it was Herod's birthday was celebrated, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. So when Herod celebrated his birthday, it was a festival where they would bring in exotic animals. They would have an excuse to get drunk. There was prostitution. And then Her Herodias' daughter, in whom he was having an affair with Herodias, Well, verse 6, where was I? <laughs> because John had said it was not lawful for you to have her. Verse 6, when Herod's birthday. So they're having a birthday party, and this birthday party becomes a little bit weird. Herodias' daughter comes out, and as we know from historians, that her name was Salome. And she was somewhere around the age of 14 to 15 years old, and she performed some sort of sensual dance that was probably taught to her by her mother in front of Herod and his noblemen. Now, when these men saw this girl dance, they saw 
the fulfilling of the lust of the flesh. And this is what John the, John, uh, the Apostle John would speak of later in 1 John chapter 2. That in the world, he says, there is the lust of the flesh. And one of the things that we learn about the lust of the flesh is that when you are in bondage to lust, it doesn't bring fulfillment. Don't you find this a little bit creepy, even disturbing, that Herod brings an adulterous, he begins an adulterous relationship with Herodias, thinking that he's going to find fulfillment with this relationship with Herodias. And then eventually he looks to his adopted daughter to try to fulfill the lust of the flesh. And when someone is in bondage to their sensual desires, it is a constant lie the devil tells you, just one more look, just one more time. If you just do this one more time, then everything, all this will go away, and then all the desires will be fulfilled. See, the deceitfulness of lust is that when you watch one more time, or you are with this person one more time, you are never satisfied. The lust of the flesh cannot satisfy you. It's a part of the world, and in the world, eventually, as Peter tells us, is going to burn with a fervent heat. The only thing that can satisfy is Jesus Christ. This is the only thing. And, you know, I was, it's interesting. And, you know, I, I remember when I was a young guy. I remember when I, we would get together for Thanksgiving. And as Thanksgiving would lead up, me and my friends, it was always our goal to eat as much as we could. I know it's, it's still my goal. But, <laughs> you know, and one of the things that we would do is we would try to increase our appetite. And one of the ways that you can increase your appetite this is just free information as we enter the holiday season, is if you eat several small meals a day. And I find it true when you look at this with the lust of the flesh. The way to increase your appetite for the lust of the flesh is just these small little uh, instances, these small little occasions, and you keep on doing it and you keep on doing it, and the appetite for the lust of the flesh continues on and continues on. And listen, here's what Jesus has to say about that. He says in Matthew chapter 5, if your right eye causes you to sin, Jesus says, pluck it out from you. He says, if if your right hand causes you, he said, cut it off. Now, he's not speaking physically. I always have to say this. You will end up looking like a pirate if you pluck out your right eye, cut up. This is speaking metaphorically. This is something that Jesus is saying, if there is radical sin, Jesus says, do something radical about it. There needs to be radical repentance. And listen, Jesus can bring freedom from that. Jesus is the answer. It's not one more time. It's not one more of this. It's not one more look. It's, it's none of those things. It's Jesus Christ and the blood that he offers through the cross at Calvary. Now, notice Matthew chapter 8 gives us a warning here in this passage. And he says, or Matthew verse 14, verse 8, it says, So she, have been prompted by her mother, said, Give me John the Baptist's head on a platter. Doesn't it wow you that she desired to murder truth more than she desired the kingdom? Here Herod says, hey, I'll give you up to half the kingdom. He says, whatever you want. She says, no, I want truth murdered. I I, want to be done with it. I want to get rid of it. I find it so interesting that there are some that desire to murder the truth of God's word when God's word presents them with the truth and requires change and requires repentance. It is there that oftentimes people say, you know what? No. I would rather murder it. I don't want half the kingdom. God is offering the kingdom of God that represents a life that is surrendered to Jesus in obedience. And oftentimes people say, you know what? I'd rather murder truth. I don't want the kingdom. I'd rather murder truth. And and oftentimes they end up serving it to somebody else on a platter. But Jesus calls us to bring the truth. When Jesus brings the truth to us, James chapter 1 tells us that we are to be doers of the word and not hearers only. See, oftentimes we hear the word of God, but we like to, like, her, like, this, like Herodias' daughter, we just want to send it to somebody else. Just move on. No, I don't, want it. I don't want to deal with the truth. I'd rather murder it. I'd rather be done with it. But God is calling us to be those children of the kingdom of God and receive with meekness the implanted word of God and have his word change us. I'm so thankful that while bondage produces lust, And it produces eventually regret. Repentance brings freedom from lust. Because Jesus said in John chapter 8, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Now notice as we continue on in in verse 13, as we read along, it says, when Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. 
And when the multitude heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude. And he was moved with compassion for them. And he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away, and they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But look what Jesus says to them in verse 16. He says, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, We have here only five loaves and two fish. And verse 18 says, bring them here to me. And in verse 19, it says, then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And he took five loaves and two fish. And it says, looking up to heaven, he blessed and he broke. And he gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitudes. So they all ate and they were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of fragments that remained. And now those who were eaten were about 5,000 men besides the women and the children. There are some scholars, both biblical and non-biblical, that suggest that this was not a literal miracle. And they have different explanations on what was actually taking place. You know, we read here that Jesus actually fed all these people, more than 5,000. Some scholars believe that there was at least 15,000 people here because it says 5,000 men and then not counting the women and the children. They were not counted back then. And there are some people that love to try to explain away the miracles of God. And they say, here's one of them. They say, here, actually, everybody packed their lunch that day. And they brought their lunch to this park. And then they saw Jesus. And then they saw this little boy who decided to share his his meal and just thinking that maybe, you know, God could do something with it and so forth. And then when they saw Jesus's smiling face, they all decided to share with one another. That's honestly one example. That's one way that some people try to explain the miracle. Here's my favorite one. The disciples had all their had all the food stashed in a cave. They had all the if you ever fed a group of people, it's a lot of work. And you got you have to take it takes a lot of storage for that amount of food. Think about storing food for 15,000 people. That's like a Costco. (laughs) You know, you think about that. But what we read here is that Jesus actually fed these people with five loaves and two fish. It's one of the things that sticks out to me immediately is the emotions of this story. You notice, first of all, that there is grief. It says in verse 13 that when Jesus heard it. It says that he departed from there by a boat to a deserted place by himself. Remember, Jesus was fully God, and yet he was still fully man. Thus, there was a humanity side to Jesus. You remember when uh, uh, Mary and Martha's brother Lazarus had died? In John's gospel, he records that my favorite verse in the Bible to memorize, John eleven thirty five, 35, Jesus wept. That was my favorite childhood verse. Anybody could say a verse for a piece of candy. John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. <laughs> that was like, it's like my go-to, man. Hook me up with the chocolate. It's just, you know. Jesus, and, and Jesus wept, and he still raised him from the dead. I'm still trying to figure that one out. Jesus wept, and then he raised him from the dead. But Jesus experienced the emotions that we experience. Our, the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 4 that we have a high priest that sympathizes with our weaknesses. He went through the same emotions. And here, his earthly cousin John had died, and he is going away for a time of grief, time to grieve over his earthly cousin that had died. You know, and then it says in verse 13 that the multitudes followed him. You know, you remember, the disciples are trying to get rid of the people. And it seems that Jesus is always trying to bring people to minister to them. And here is God's chosen men to carry on his work, and they're always trying to get rid of people. You can imagine this, a church that is constantly trying to get rid of people. It just wouldn't work. So, But the other thing, the other emotion that we read is that of compassion. You notice in verse 14, it says that Jesus was moved with compassion. I heard a story of a preacher who was talking about the time when he was a young boy and he was converted. He was recounting this 
the situation. He went to Sunday school and he attended. And he remembered that his teacher had, he had seen his Sunday school teacher at a shop. And as the Sunday school teacher came around the counter, he says, I remember this man seeing me and weeping over my sins. He says, I've never even given a thought of my sins. And here was this man that was weeping over my sins. And he says, I still remember the power when he put his hand on my shoulder to pray for me. And that man was D.L. Moody. If you ever studied the life of D.L. Moody, he was one of the most powerful evangelists North America has ever seen. He was like a living, breathing Bible character. The man was empowered by the Lord. And he says, I still remember the compassion that a man had for a child when he saw me and he wept over my sin. This is the kind of compassion that Jesus is speaking of here. You know, it's interesting, you know, this feeding of the 5,000 was a miracle that was born out of compassion. Jesus was moved by the physical and the spiritual needs of the people. And what is fascinating about this miracle is that Jesus is feeding the, this, this group of people. It's recorded in all four Gospels. And I believe that when something is recorded in all four Gospels, the Holy Spirit is desiring that we give attention to it. It is something that God does not want us to miss. And I believe it's this, is that God had compassion on people. Jesus was moved with compassion. And this was something that Jesus was trying to convey to his disciples of that day. And I believe it's something that Jesus is trying to convey to his disciples of today. You know, it's easy in the world that we live in to get extremely frustrated. I remember when COVID started and they started putting, you know, all the rules in place that were even more ridiculous that we have today. It seems that they've lessened some of the craziness of the rules. And I remember when, you know, do you remember when the arrows came out in the grocery store? And they said, you have to walk this way. And I remember walking down the ice cream aisle, grabbing ice cream, and one of, there was somebody there who said, sir, you can't, you can't walk this way. The arrow says you have to go that way. And I'm thinking, there's no way I'm doing like three laps around the, the grocery store to get ice cream. Although it's probably not a bad idea now that I think about it. But I remember just, I remember standing there and thinking, I want to throw this ice cream at you. I was so annoyed. And I realized it was ice cream, and I reached for the cucumber. But uh, I was just, I remember being so just annoyed that somebody would tell me what direction to walk in a grocery store. And I recognized in myself as I left, and I was convicted, and the Lord showed me how annoyed I can become with people. And one of the things that the Lord was teaching me is that I need to be moved to compassion rather than annoyance. And let me ask you this morning, what are, what are you more moved by today? When you see all the craziness that is happening in this world, are you moved with compassion? Or are you moved with annoyance? Are you moved because people are frustrating you or this life is getting frustrating and it's, we're becoming more disgruntled, it seems? I've found that I need to become more compassionate. You know, the whole world is moving in that direction of frustration and annoyance. And Jesus is telling his bride, his church, it's time to have compassion more than ever. It's time that we be the light of the world, the city that is set upon a hill and is moved with compassion for a lost and a dying world. I believe this is the message that Jesus is speaking in this parable, or not in the parable, in this passage, excuse me. I notice in verse 16, it says that Jesus tells his disciples, he says, they don't need to go away. He, Jesus says, you need to give them something to eat. The other gospels record for us a conversation that takes place, I believe it was Philip that came to Jesus and he says it would take almost, uh, I think he says it would t be 200 denarii or almost a year's working wage to feed this size of the crowd. And, you know, he tells Jesus this and Jesus says, you know, what do you have? Go out there and find, go out there, see what is amongst the crowd, see if anybody has anything to eat. You, have you ever done, have, you, have anyone ever asked you to do something and you know it's just like, this is just the dumbest idea I have ever, I'm not putting any effort. Could you imagine the disciples? Jesus saying, hey, we're going to feed this crowd over 15,000 people. I want you to go out there and see if you can find any food. Can you imagine knowing some of the disciples, knowing Peter? Anybody have any food? 
nope, nobody. <laughs> you know, just, <laughs> just, this is what I would do anyway, you know. I just, you know, I, you imagine that. And then Andrew comes back, and he says, I found a lad that has five loaves and two fish. And it seems that he's excited about that, genuinely. It seems that he's pumped, that he found some food. And then it seems the other disciples look at him like, what are you talking about? Because then he says right after that, but what are those among so many? <laughs> you know, it seems like he's got this great idea. And then, he's, then doubt creeps in once the disciples make other faces at him. But notice as we read about this, pa- as we read in this passage in Jesus, we read about someone who is genuinely moved to compassion. One of the things that we understand about compassion is that compassion moves us to action. Notice what Jesus says here in verse 18. He said, bring them to me. And as God's servants, as servant leaders, and what God has called us to be compassionate, one of the things I've oftentimes found is that the gifts that Jesus has given us need to, brought, need to be brought first to the Lord. They need to be dedicated to Jesus. You know, it's interesting. We know here in verse 19 that he took five loaves and two fish, and it says that he looked up to heaven. The five loaves that it speaks here were barley loaves that were the cheapest you can find. And the two fish that it speaks of here were small fish. Oftentimes they're, you know, they're described as sardine fish. One of the Gospels, the Greek word that is used, oftentimes what they would do, th- that the, the Greek words that is used for these fish, is that they would take these fish because they were so small and they would remove all the meat from them and then they would combine it with other things to make a relish because the meat was so insignificant that they would take this meat and they would combine it with all these other things so that it would fill you up. And this is the kind of, this is the kind of, it's not, you know, it's not like, you know, they, they got salmon from Costco. It's not like, it ain't the club pack from Superstore. It's just, these are extremely small, insignificant things. And I think this is so interesting because Jesus says, hey, bring this to me. What did you have in your life that you can bring to the Lord? You say, no, no, it's too small. It's too insignificant. Jesus says, hey, bring it here. You know, the other, the other disciples might be laughing, but Jesus says, hey, you bring it to me. Whatever you have that you can bring to the Lord, the Lord wants to use that for his glory. You think about all the different people that God has used. You know, one of my favorite things is to see God use somebody that the rest of the world scratches their head and they think, this shouldn't be happening. This is, not, this is not reality. You're right. It's Jesus. <laughs> Jesus has said, bring whatever you have in your life that is small and is insignificant and bring it to the Lord and let's see what the Lord can do with it. Notice as we continue on, the second thing that when we are moved to compassion and we are used by the Lord, obedience is required in verse 19. It says that he commanded the multitudes to sit down in the grass You know, one of the things I've learned is that sometimes obedience is required even when it doesn't make sense. Remember, the disciples didn't read the end of the chapter. They have no idea what's going on. Jesus says to them, hey, sit the the crowd down in groups, arrange them, and you can imagine how long this would take. You know, you've been in groups where you sat down, I want to be in that group. That looks like the, you know, I want to be with them. They look like they're going to eat first or whatever. They, They had no idea. They had no idea that Jesus was going to feed them. Jesus said, hey, sit them down in groups. The disciples were thinking, okay. Uh, we're, they were just obedient. They had no idea what was going to take place. And oftentimes, obedience to the Lord doesn't make sense to us. But we're called to obedience. Think of all the times in the word of God that God, that God called somebody to obedience. And he didn't tell them the end of the story. Do you remember the life of Joshua? Do you remember when Joshua, when the Lord told Joshua, hey, I want you to send the priest with the Ark of the Covenant to the Jordan River? And Joshua was thinking, then what? Jesus said, just do it, (laughs) you know? And then they go down and they come to the edge of the river. And then it says that as soon as the priests come to, their feet came to the edge of the river, it said that the Jordan River dried up and stopped and that all of Israel, over 2 million people, the children of Israel, crossed over on, on dry land. Jesus didn't tell them the end. He just said, go and do it. Think about when Joshua came to Jericho. How many times do you think the army questioned Joshua? You're God's next leader? What do we do? 
um, we're going to go to the city and we're going to march. And then we're going to attack? Mm, no. <laughs> we're going to march the second day. And then we're going to attack. Mm, we're going to march the third day. Then we attack? Mm, we're just going to keep marching. How about on the seventh day? Let's take it six extra laps. We're going to go around it seven times. Jesus didn't oftentimes tell the end of the story until the God's people got to see it. And one of the times, one of the things that I oftentimes have learned when I obey the Lord is that I just step out in obedience. Lord, I don't know what you're, I don't, I don't know what this is going to look like. And I honestly have no idea. You know, there's sometimes people come to me and they say, so wh why are we doing that? I just feel like the Lord told me to do it and I'm obeying, obeying him. Yeah, but why are you doing it? I have no clue. And people are like, no, no, you know. No, I don't. I have no idea. <laughs> I'm just obeying the Lord. I just, there's been so many times in my life where I felt like the Lord has said to do something and I've obeyed and God has blessed it. And that's one of the keys is obeying even when it doesn't make sense. The third thing we read here is that servant leaders that are moved with compassion look to the power of the Lord. Notice in verse 19, it says that Jesus looked to heaven. The typical Jewish prayer would have been praying. They would have prayed. An individual would have looked up to heaven and they would pray. And one of the prayers that the, one of the Jewish prayers before a meal was was this. Blessed art thou, Jehovah, our God, king of the universe, who brings forth the breath or the bread of the earth. You know, oftentimes we often feel unequipped. I just there's just times where I've just said, Lord, I, I'm not equipped to do this. I don't have the know how. I've watched like 40 YouTube videos and it still doesn't make sense to me. The Lord, one of the things I love about the Lord is that the Lord calls the unequipped and then he equips them along the way when we obey him. You think about Gideon, for example. One of my favorite characters in the Bible, Gideon in Judges chapter 6. When the Lord appeared, the Lord physically appeared to Gideon. And this is what he tells him. This is what the Lord tells him. The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Do you remember Gideon's response to Jesus telling him that he is a mighty man of valor? This is what he says. He says, oh, Lord, how can I save Israel? He says, my clan is the weakest of Manasseh. Traditionally, Manasseh was the weakest tribe. And he says, I am the least of my father's house. He says, listen, my tribe's the weakest. You know that. My clan's the weakest in our tribe. And he says, I'm the weakest in my father's house. I'm literally the biggest wimp in Israel. This is what the, he tells the Lord. And then this is what, the, and I love that Jesus doesn't argue with him on that. He's just like, you're right. <laughs> but the Lord tells him, he says, surely I will be with you. And he says, you will defeat the Midianites as one man. One of the greatest themes of the Bible is that when God calls people, he calls them and he empowers them. I love how that when we looked at, we, we're looking to heaven. We're looking to heaven for the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you remember when uh, it was Elijah, when he came to battle the prophets of Baal, Baal, and he was there and he says, hey, you guys, you guys make a sacrifice. I'll, I'll make a sacrifice. We'll build our altars to, to our God. I'll build my altar to Jehovah. You build your altar to Baal. And we'll see whoever answers with fire first. He says, then we'll know who the Lord is. Who the, who the true God is. And you remember they spent all afternoon trying, cutting themselves, asking Baal to drop fire from heaven. And you remember Elijah, he just prepared his sacrifice, just going about doing all the practical things. And then it says that he looked to heaven and then fire fell. And a fire oftentimes in the Bible is a symbol of the presence of the Lord and the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's oftentimes what we do. We're just, you know, we're just doing the practical things. We're setting up chairs. We're setting up the sound system and just, but Lord, if you're, if this is actually going to happen, if we're going to, if we're going to be, if we're going to minister to people, if we're going to, if we're going to be used by you, we need the fire to fall from heaven. We need the power of the Holy Spirit because that's the thing that's going to last. That's the thing that's going to change somebody's life. So we have to look to heaven. We have to look to heaven for the, and we have to wait for the Lord to answer by fire and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, as we continue on, the last thing we see here is that there was a breaking that took place in their life. Notice in verse 19, it says that Jesus blessed and he broke it. 
speaking of the loaves. And then it says that he gave it to his disciples. Please take notice there. It says that blessed and broken are used in the same sentence. You know, if there's any two things that I don't want in the same sentence is for me to be broken and then to be blessed. I, I just, I'd rather skip ahead. I'd like to get the cliff notes on brokenness. I'd like to just move into the blessed part. But understand that brokenness is the artery that leads to blessing. Do you remember Jacob in the Old Testament? You remember when Jacob was, it says that he physically wrestled with the Lord in Genesis chapter 2, or in thir- Genesis 32. Think about that. He physically wrestled with the Lord. What's your go-to move if you're wrestling with the Lord? It just, you think about that. It's, it's, that's, that just blows my mind. But in that passage, it says that the Lord touched the socket of his hip. And, he, the, and Jacob says, hey, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. And then it says after that, when the Lord touched the socket of his hip, it says then that the Lord let him go and he says that you are blessed. See, oftentimes we want, you know, we wrestle with the Lord in prayer, but we don't want to wrestle in brokenness. We'd rather just, Lord, just, just bless the work. Lord, bless our ministry, bless our servanthood. We're trying, you know, we're trying to share the gospel with somebody else and, you know, just, just bless that situation. But the Lord oftentimes allows us to go through brokenness. I heard a quote this week that to, <laughs> we are to be very aware of a servant of the Lord who claims to be blessed, but has no limp in their step. We're called to minister in brokenness because it's in brokenness that God really uses us. I think it was A.W. Tozer said that before God can use a man greatly, he must hurt him deeply. And brokenness is required. And brokenness is not fun. I can tell you that. I've been through several (laughs) times of, of brokenness where I've said, Lord, why is this happening? I don't understand. I don't understand why this is taking place. But I find that in my own life, that when God breaks me of something, I either have the opportunity to go towards bitterness or I have the opportunity to go towards blessedness. The church, I believe right now, the church, not just our church, but churches across North America are being broken. We're being humbled. We're coming to the place where we're recognizing, no, it's not about us. It's always been about Jesus. And we're getting back to that. We're getting back to his word. We're looking at what Jesus says about his about eternity. And we're becoming to that, we're coming to that place where we're becoming to brokenness. Lord, Lord, it's all about you. Now, one of the things that can easily take place in our brokenness is bitterness can creep in. And bitterness can come in and say, Oh, this shouldn't be this way. You're too good for that, or whatever the case may be. But it's in our brokenness that we recognize the greatness of Jesus. And it's all about Jesus. And it was always all about Jesus and about his work and about the power of the, his Holy Spirit. It's not about us. And it's in those moments of brokenness when we recognize it's all about Jesus and it's all about the cross. It's there we recognize how blessed we really are. See, when we're put into the hands of Jesus, and he breaks us. It is there that blessedness can come forth. Notice one last thing. Lastly, as we look at this, in verse 20, have have you ever wondered this? In verse 20, it says, so they all ate and they were filled, and they took up 12 baskets full of fragments that remained. Do you find it interesting that all four gospel writers say that there were leftovers, that they picked up bag baskets of fragments. If it's written in all four Gospels, don't you think that there is a reason that the Lord would have it in there? Have it in there? You may say, oh, I know. Leftovers are biblical. Preach on that, preacher. <laughs> you know. I believe that there is a lesson there. And that Jesus does not want us to waste the gifts that he has given us. There are things that the Lord has given you. Maybe they're spiritual gifts. Maybe they're practical gifts. But the Lord has given them to you, and he does not want you to waste them. He wants you to use them. He wants you to minister and serve other people out of a heart of compassion. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, for our time this morning.
Thank you, Jesus, that you've given us gifts, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we're able to minister to one another, Lord. We're able to serve, we're able to encourage, and we're able to use the gifts that you've given us to bless one another, Lord. Lord, we pray for any that are here this morning that are broken. Lord, keep them out of the path of bitterness, Lord, but place them in the path of blessedness, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.